Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Stephen and I'm a popular investor on eToro. Thank you very much for listening to my video today. And as usual, please, please, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate the effort in to help the YouTube algorithm. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about some key events that happened in the market last week. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about our performance as well as our strategy. So as we move on to last week, our performance was pretty good uh, considering. Our portfolio was up about 1.65%. Uh, it was a strong week uh, for the US markets. Europe also did very well, uh, but there was some weakness in China as uh, a lot of people started to take profits after the recent uh, upsurge in Chinese stocks. Uh, Bitcoin didn't do that well last week. It dropped a couple of percent. Uh, but some altcoins did perform pretty well, which helped my portfolio. Uh, I also did lots of short-term uh, positions with great success in uh, the Spanish ESP25 index, which tracks the, Span the 25 top Spanish stocks, uh, as well as the US dollar uh, Swiss uh, Forex pair, uh, sugar, natural gas, uh, and, and some other things. Uh, as well as I did some, uh, I closed a medium term position in ASOS as well. I closed that at a 6% profit. Um, I'm a lot more bullish uh, overall on, uh, not so bullish overall on uh, UK and European stocks. Uh, that is because I think that they are quite significantly behind the curve on increasing their interest rates. They're very much behind uh, the US. Uh, and anything that's kind of quite speculative in nature, um, which didn't have a very strong balance sheet, uh, I thought it was best to close that out at a profit. If we look at how we perform compared with the other benchmarks, the NASDAQ was up about 3.3%. The S&P was up about 1.6%. And the FTSE was up about 1.76%. And as I said, Bitcoin was down about 3.02% last week. So all in all, our portfolio performance makes sense because we have uh, do have not only US stocks, but we have European stocks uh, as well as uh, Chinese stocks, which didn't perform that great last week and crypto, which was um, kind of a moderate performance last week. So um, I think our portfolio did very well and it's done very well in the year so far. So if we look at 2023, our portfolio is beating all of the different uh, indexes. Uh, our portfolio is up 21.27% uh, so far year to date. And we've had quite a good start to February as well. Uh, if we compare that to the NASDAQ, that was up about 14.7%. Uh, the S&P was up about 7.7%. FTSE's up about 6.4% the year. The Hang Seng Index, which is the Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange, that's up about 7.13% and Bitcoin's up a whopping 38.23%. So I'm very happy with the overall start uh, of our portfolio to 2023. I know it was a very tough 2022 uh, for all, but I'm glad now that uh, some of the patience that you had uh, throughout 2022 is starting to be rewarded now in 2023 because our portfolio, after all, is for a long-term portfolio. If we look at the main news from what happened last week, uh, the US stock resumed their winning streak, and this was due to some earning surprises that were quite good um, for earning releases last week, as well as a, a key Fed decision, which I'll go over now. Uh, the Fed um, had a meeting, an FOMC meeting uh, last week, uh, and it was decided that they would increase their interest rates by 0.25%, uh, which was kind of the consensus of the market if you look at the uh, federal funds rate futures. Uh, and this was seen by investors generally as positive. And Jerome Powell's overall message during that meeting was, um, that they would have to continue to do rate increases. Um, but if they did significantly over tighten uh, and then in and there was a dramatic effect on the inflation rate and it went below the Fed's target, that they did have the ability to use those tools to pull back 
if there is an over tightening and uh, start to reduce those interest rates again. Just by putting that on the table, it did really help with sentiment last week. And also the the amount that they're increasing the rates is, is significantly slowing. Um, it is expected that there would be another interest rate rise um, possibly at the next FOMC meeting. But if it happens, it's likely to be very small, probably another 0.25 um, increase. Uh, there was also some positive data um, th that the unemployment rate has slipped to 3.4% in US. Uh, this was actually seen as quite surprising considering those interest rate rises over uh, the last kind of year or so. And it's actually the lowest level since 1969. And last week they added over 517 job, thousand jobs in January uh, as a whole. So uh, unemployment is really still at historic lows. And it really does show that the Fed does have some room to increase these interest rates without it significantly affecting uh, the unemployment uh, market. However, uh, the wages have stayed, although there has been extra jobs created, wages have stayed uh, quite stagnant over the last month or two. Uh, we also saw uh, earnings reports last week from Amazon, Apple and Meta. Uh, they were quite mixed. Uh, Meta reported a very uh, strong earnings report. Uh, and that went down very well. And uh, obviously, Meta has bounced off the bottoms uh, of a few months ago and has actually picked up quite significantly. Um, and also, we have Amazon uh, and Apple in our portfolio. We also saw in Europe, we saw that the ECB has raised its key interest rates by 0.5%, uh, so half a percentage point. Uh, and that has taken the deposit rate to 2.5%. Uh, the central bank is planning and is expecting to continue to increase those rates, probably by the same amount in March, 0.5%. And this is due to continuing underlying inflation pressures. Don't forget Europe is a little bit behind uh, the US because they started uh, raising those interest rates a little bit later and they weren't as, as aggressive in the first few interest rate hikes. Um, so they still have quite a way to go in in reducing that inflation pressure. We also saw the headline rate of inflation in the Eurozone uh, has started to cool and it was more than expected in January. And that is down to an annual rate of 8.5%. Seems pretty high, but that's down from 9.2 on a year on year basis uh, from the previous month. So it's going in the right direction. Uh, it's just reduced. There's just a lagging effect with interest rates and it's going to take some time for that to come down. And that's why I'm a little bit more bearish on Europe uh, and the UK than I am on, on the US and China. We also saw the Bank of England has voted again to raise the interest rates by half a percentage point. That's taken it up to 4%. Uh, and uh, that was kind of in line uh, with expectations as well. Uh, the Chinese market did suffer a bit last week and it was kind of put down to the majority of it uh, was put down to kind of a lag after the Lunar New Year holidays. Uh, and also we have seen that a lot of investors are starting to take advantage of some of those early gains that they got in the year and starting to take profit. Uh, I'm still very bullish on China for this year. I expect the Chinese market to do very well. Uh, with the reopening and especially COVID sensitive stocks that we have in our portfolio, like Win Macau and Heidelau, Fosun Group, uh, and a few others. We also saw China's official manufacturing purchase and managers index, which is known as the PMI, and that rose to 50.1 in January from December's 47%. Why that's significant is when the PMI uh, increases to over 50, that generally sends that they're in a sense of growth, uh, that the economy is in sense of growth. And is it under 50, then the then it's starting to contract. Uh, we've seen a lot of Chinese people starting to go back to work now that these COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted. There's less supply chain issues. Um, so um, I think it's very good moving forward. And that's a very good 
a piece of data for, for the future of China. We also saw the IMS, in addition to this, has raised its annual growth forecast for China. And that's following the removal of the pandemic restrictions. Uh, they're expecting it to grow, the economy to grow by 5.2 this year. And if we look at the October forecast, which was 4.4, um, it's, it's very promising news. And a lot of analysts have changed their view on China in light of those pandemic restrictions opening up. And it's still planning to keep its estimate for 2024 at 4.5%. If we look at our top three performing stocks of last week, the top performing stock in our portfolio uh, last week uh, was Zim Shipping, uh, and that was up by about 22.78%. Uh, and if we look at Coinbase, which is the second best performing stock in our portfolio, that was up about 21.61%. Uh, and that is mainly because of uh, the increase of activity in crypto over the last kind of month or so. Uh, and there's been a lot higher volumes than they had previously during the depths of the bear market. Um, and obviously, it was at a very low rate as well. So uh, it's looking quite promising on Coinbase, although we're still far, quite far behind on it. Uh, and the third best performing stock of last week uh, was FedEx. And that was up about at 12.65 percent so all in all there was some really key growth drivers in our portfolio last week so if we move on to our desk by charts edition i just wanted to point out four key charts which i'm going to go through now so the chart to the left i thought was quite interesting which i i saw today uh, and what it is, is the S&P 500, but it's the best performance through the first 21 days. And this take, this chart goes from 1928 to 2023. And as you can see, um, in eighth place now is 2023 and being up by 7.3% in that first 21 trading days uh, of the year puts it in eighth place in um, in that uh, nearly a hundred year period. So if we look at that, if we look at other years as well, where they performed very well, you can see that the vast majority uh, ended up finishing the year uh, higher uh, than the first 21 uh, trading days, uh, with the exception of number one and number two. Uh, but there were some really significant increases uh, of 13.6 and 13.2. Um, I think that this kind of bodes well, quite well for um, the rest of the year. But I just want to kind of warn people that it's probably going to be quite volatile and it's probably still going to be quite based upon the decisions of the Federal Reserve and what's happening uh, with inflation um, and how they manage that. So uh, I just want to say that it could be quite volatile moving forward into this year, but there are some quite promising signs. If we look at the second chart to the right, I also thought that was pretty interesting because it says that in 2023, year to date, all major asset classes are, um, are up in 2023 so far. So the biggest one, obviously, is Bitcoin up over 40 percent. Uh, and then obviously the lowest is um, commodities. Um, and, and bonds, but um, if we look at look at 2022, um, you know, over 90, 95 percent of the different asset classes were significantly down last year, uh, with just some minor upside in in obviously commodities, which did well in light of the war in Ukraine and Russia. So the second shot, the third chart I wanted to point out was the U.S. Uh, real uh, GDP. And this is really what I want to show is, is it possible that we might avoid a uh, might avoid a recession? And the answer to that is possibly, and it could be a, a, a very soft landing. Uh, there is also the potential for there to be a hard landing as well. But um, the way things are managing uh, at the moment by the Federal Reserve, I am 
expecting a kind of a light to moderate recession. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, by the way, mean stocks are, are going to go down. Um, there's a lot of factors going to go into that, especially individual companies and sectors. And there are a lot of things that are obviously priced in with interest rates, et cetera, and inflation. Um, but what this chart showed is uh, another new time, a new high for economic output with quarter three and quarter four bouncing back after consecutive declines in quarter one and quarter two. Uh, so that's a, a, a promising thing. Uh, and however, the growth rate continued to slow compared to the previously previous year. So the 1.1% year on year increase is the slowest since quarter two, 2020. So it is starting to see a, a slowing of that growth, which is very expected with the interest rate and what they're trying to do with demand destruction uh, in order to bring down inflation. Um, but I think the markets are starting to price in a softer landing than it was expected. I think towards the end of the year, they were expecting a lot harsher recession than we, we might end up getting. The fourth chart, which I wanted to point out, which I thought was really interesting, kind of really sums up uh, what's going on. And in, that is because the spending in the US hasn't gone down um, significantly. Um, and, and the main reason to that is because people are using up the uh, excess savings. People have been spending on their credit cards. And as you can see, credit card debt has gone up pretty significantly. And with that, the credit card interest rates uh, have also increased as well. Uh, and uh, we, we can see now that credit card debt has been rising and, and the cost of that debt is now spiked to over 19%. And this is the highest rate on record with data going back to just 1995. So how long will it take before this starts to impact spending? And my answer to that is it should, after a while, uh, and there usually is a lagging effect, start to reduce uh, spending. And this is really what the US is trying to do um, by creating demand destruction and that creating demand destruction, uh, then starts to lower those uh, inflation rates. Uh, and then if they want to stimulate later on the future, they will cut those interest rates and encourage people to spend again. Um, but um, it's quite clear that people's savings are starting to deplete and that they have a lot of credit card debt at higher and higher interest rates. And at some point, this could uh, translate into lower spending, consumer spending. So as we move on to now to the crypto news and views and what happened in crypto last week, and Bitcoin dipped last week to slightly under 23,000, uh, just down a couple of percent. Uh, but the crypto market has been pretty buoyant, especially in 2023. We've seen really uh, great increases. And really what I'm seeing is really quite a repeat of 2019. Um, we bottomed um, in uh, the end of 2028 in the last crypto, in the last Bitcoin cycle, four year cycle. Uh, and then we start, saw an increase of Bitcoin from 3,500 3, uh, to up to about 12,000. And we're following a very similar trajectory. So a year after um, we hit those uh, a year after hitting the all-time high, highs, um, we hit the hit the lows so far of about 15,000. And since then, it's been kind of gradually increasing. And we've seen some good accumulation and some and good volume. So it's very positive, I think, at the moment for the crypto market. Uh, but I just want to put a slight uh, word of caution on that, that I'm not expecting us to hit all-time highs in 2023 and it's probably not likely to happen until 2024 after the bitcoin halving however there is still some good upside ahead of holding cryptos um but just be a little bit careful not to be buying on these pumps um at the top of the pumps because we could have some volatility and some drawdowns along the way uh, we also saw last week we saw dydx um, and that is a, a per decentralized platform. Uh, and they 
had originally planned to have a very large token unlock, uh, and that was supposed to happen in uh, early February, around now. However, the DYDX, they went to a vote and they've decided to um, increase that vesting period so that uh, a lot of early investors are not able to um, uh, cash out a lot of the DYDX tokens, uh, which has had a very positive effect on the uh, DYDX price. Actually, I did have some DYDX in our portfolio and I did take profit on that last month. And the main reason was because I was expecting this uh, huge token unlock. So I will keep an I will keep an eye on that. But that's been um, put much later in the year. Uh, but it could be quite likely that at some stage I might add DYDX back to our portfolio because I do think it has a very good future. Also, I wanted to say about Hedera Hashgraph HBAR, which is another one of our major holdings on our portfolio. And what we see um, is that if we look at the fundamentals of uh, Hedera Hashgraph, in during quarter four, its network fundamentals continue to show growth. Uh, and we saw uh, increased trade uh, transfer volume and transaction transactions and they were increasing by 123 and 70% respectively quarter over quarter, quarter over quarter. So we're seeing a lot of activity on the on the HBAR network. And um, that's why during this bear market, I significantly increased our, our HBAR holding. And I, I do think that is going to be one of the best performers in the next crypto bull run. Um, but only time will tell if I'm right on that, but um, I have positioned accordingly. We also saw that A116, um, which is a large uh, venture uh, capital fund, uh, they voted against the proposal to, to deploy Uniswap uh, version 3 on BNB, um, on the Binance Smart Chain, and they were going to do that via the Wormhole Bridge. Um, and they hold a significant... Uh, voting share um, within that proposal. So it's it's quite likely that that proposal will get uh, shut down. And really what that is, is kind of a war between them and Jump, Jump, Jump Street Capital, uh, who also uh, have quite a significant amount of voting power as well. Um, but it looks like um, they are much likelier uh, to go uh, with an Ethereum uh, base bridge. We also saw um, Ethereum, uh, the total circulating supply has now reached a post-merge low at approximately 120.5 million tokens. And this just really shows the power of uh, the new Ethereum on proof of stake. Uh, and that is because the currency is now becoming uh, deflationary and uh, a portion of those tokens are burned on a regular daily basis. Um, and now that Ethereum is a deflationary currency, um, which will become more deflationary over time. And as we see more use cases for Ethereum and Ethereum based uh, networks, uh, then I think it's going to be very strong on the Ethereum price uh, moving forward into the next crypto bull run. So the last chart I just wanted to um, touch upon was the ARK Invest Bitcoin targets by 2030. This was released in ARK Invest's uh, latest report, and there is quite a lot of hopium. Um, so these aren't necessarily my price targets, but I thought it was quite interesting to show you what was expected um, from ARK Invest. As you know, that's Kathy Wood's um, main fund. And what she is actually expecting is they've broken it down into three cases. So a bear case, which to me, it doesn't sound very bearish, uh, but that is the bear case. A, a base case, uh, which is probably what they're expecting is most likely to happen. And then a bull case. So their target for the bear case is 258,500 uh, by 2030. Uh, which is still uh, extremely significant if we compare that to prices now. So that's seven years later. So that's another halving cycle that's got to be, you know, taken into account. 
And then uh, the base case is they, which is what they're most likely expecting, is Bitcoin to hit six hundred and six hundred and eighty-two thousand eight hundred by two thousand and thirty. So that is a very significant increase. Uh, and then the bull case is that they is that Bitcoin would hit one point four eight million uh, by two thousand and thirty. Um, I bet. Everybody would really like that to happen uh, because it would mean that the Bitcoin has significantly gone up in value. Um, but I would err on the side of caution when looking at price targets because uh, no one particularly knows what's going to happen in Bitcoin over the next uh, seven years, as is, as is this model. Uh, however, obviously, because of the way Bitcoin is structured with the four-year cycle, um, and Bitcoin mining rewards getting halved uh, every four years during those cycles. It means that uh, the supply is fixed and everybody knows what the supply is going to be, uh, as well as as we increase uh, the usage and the ownership of Bitcoin and there is more and more demand for Bitcoin, this should have an upward trajectory on the price. So I uh, just wanted to bring that to you today. Thank you very much for listening to my video today. Also, don't forget to join my Discord group if you haven't already. I've got lots of new copiers that have joined over the last kind of couple of weeks. So if you're not in our Discord group, you are missing out. And it's very important that you enjoy, you join that and you can talk with other like-minded investors uh, who are in a very similar boat to you. And we're constantly having discussions in there. You can also ask me any questions at any time if you have them. So until then, have a great week ahead. Thank you.